So, Chris, introduce yourself. Sure. Um, Chris Kokoris. I'm the CEO of U Financial Group here in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Nice. And uh, how did U Financial get tied in with Cherapy? Uh, again, great question. I, I think, uh, you know, it was it was organic in my eyes, right? It was the fact that I had been a client friend of your state and, uh, you know, that relationship grew and blossomed. And, you know, I think one morning uh, before work, I was in here and you shared the vision of what, you know, Cherapy was all about. Right. And uh, I think the alignment was spot on with... Um, a lot of the things that we hold dear, you know, service and support of the community and uh, an appreciation for those that have served. That, that's true. Uh, Cherokee and you Financial, our, our goals and values align seamlessly. Mm -hmm. seamlessly. Uh, what kind of services does you uh, Financial offer? You know, kind of everything. Everything across the board from uh, super complicated um, uh, employee retention or, or retirement planning and, and estate planning to uh, pretty simply helping young folks and new families save for retirement and college and protect themselves if something goes wrong. That's nice. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a lot of good services to yeah. offer. Yeah, so kind of over the board. How can, how can people find you? Pretty easily. We're on uh, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we just unleashed a new website. It's pretty cool. Uh, Ufinancialgroup.com. Okay. Pretty easy to find. But um, yeah, pr pretty locatable. Google's powerful powerful being. You it know? is, it is. Yeah. Perfect. It, well, it's, it's great working with you. And Absolutely. We're excited to bring out these episodes. Awesome. Trent, hey. welcome, man. How you doing today? Good. How are you? Not so bad. I'm so excited to have you on this episode of Cherry Beer. Me, I love all of our episodes, but working in EMS myself, I get, I get it. I yes. get you, right? So tell, tell me, tell me about your path to uh, being a paramedic. Like, where, where, how did you get from EMT to paramedic? What led you to this? Where you're at now? Um. It was kind of straightforward. I uh, I saw other providers, uh, paramedics, um, good and bad. I saw paramedics that I wanted to emulate. Okay. Um, but I, what drove me to be a paramedic uh, was some of the poor providers that I saw. Um, I, I didn't want uh, patients to deal with that anymore um, or deal with the lack of empathy um, that they receive from some providers so that's what ultimately pushed me to be a paramedic um, did, you, did you know you wanted to do this coming out of, coming out of high school no um, I, I went to college for a couple years uh, moved into a firehouse in Lancaster County and they required that you go get your EMT, went to go get my EMT, uh, really didn't even like EMS, uh, <laughs> and ended up ended up falling in love with it. Um, it's something that I finally was good at in life, uh, kind of found my passion, uh, so just kind of pushed it from there. And you know as well as I do, people don't get into EMS to become millionaires. No. So you've got to have the heart, you've got to have the passion. And the love of the career, and you gotta love people. Absolutely, you, you have to. You you can't get in this job and not love people. Yeah. So the one the one thing in pre-hospital career that we deal a lot with more than the average person mm -hmm. is loss. Yeah. And I I find how long have you been in with EMS? Uh, right around eight years. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're right there about the same time. I've been doing it for 13 years, on and off, full-time and part-time. Okay. But I, one thing I struggle with is uh, when, when, some, when there's death. Mm -hmm. We're around it so much that 
I don't, unless it's personally affecting me, I'm just like, it's, it is what it is, you know what I mean? It, People die. Yeah, it's commonplace to a... Uh... I don't want to say I struggle with sympathy or empathy, mm -hmm. but it's common. We're around it all the time. How yeah. do you, how do you deal with loss, death, um, that kind of stuff in the job? Like, do you have a decompression? What do you do? What do you, what helps you? Um... Honestly, family. Um, it. I'm blessed to have a wife that's in healthcare. Oh, that makes it a lot easier. So she 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 gets it. She understands it. Um, when I come home and I'm like, look, I had a bad day. I'm wrecked. Just, I'm, yeah. I, I, <laughs> if if I'm upset, this is why. Um, and and she's cool about it. Uh, and she she's super forgiving and understanding. And uh, and and that's honestly my my saving grace. So. That's good. That's yeah. good. Um, any any specific stories that that pop out in your head, good, bad, indifferent, of of loss or 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 life? Um. There's a there's a few that that pop up. Uh, one of your previous guests. Uh, J Lo. Yes, uh, Jason. Episode he, two. Yeah, he uh, he talked about a fire on Emerald Street. Uh, Emerald Street. That was a, a Sunday morning, if I remember correctly. Um, multiple calls, reported entrapment, and um, the grandmother was inside. It was a first floor fire, and she was trapped on the second floor with her grandchildren, if I remember the story correctly. Uh, a uh, my my partner. Uh, at the time, him and I went to that fire. Okay. And when we got there, it was chaotic scene. Um, police were grabbing uh, children out of the window from uh, what we found out to be the grandmother of the children. And they... I didn't, I didn't know you were there prior to putting this episode out. Yeah. And I've known you for a while. Right. I didn't know you were actually there. Yeah. We were, we were the first arriving ambulance. The people outside were saying there could be anywhere from one to literally like 15 people inside. Tell me about what happened here. Can you speak up? Uh, sure. Yeah. I was, um, I came up, I live in DC. I came up to pick my son up for the weekend. On my way back home, I saw smoke and I was driving by. So I parked the car, jumped out, ran over to the house, and I saw this other guy over here on the side of the building pushing a big dumpster up in the building. And so I'm like, what's going on? I see smoke. And he looked up, and I looked up, and we saw three kids hanging out of the window from the top floor. So we they actually did the climb on the air conditioner, started getting the kids down, and handed them down to him. We got the first two, and the third one, he just jumped out of the window. I guess the smoke was getting darker and it got hotter, so he let go. And my man caught him, you know, the rack was catch. He's over there getting treated now. But he tells me that when he got there, that was uh, their grandmother was handing him out the window. I never saw her. You know, I dialed 911, uh, fire and everybody showed up, but still no sign of the grandmother. So I have no idea what happened to her. So thankfully, you know, to her credit, she, she saved all of her grandchildren, got them all out. Um, but she was overcome, and she passed away in the middle bedroom on the second floor. So she gave her life to get all of those grandchildren out, yep. getting them out the window. Yep. The fire happened here on the 300 block of Emerald Street. You can see the balloons behind me showing the outpouring of support. One woman died in that fire, but her family says she saved three children. 67-year-old Jackie Black lived here for more than 40 years. When the fire started on the ground floor of the house Saturday morning, her daughter Antoinette says her mother searched for a way to get the three grandchildren out of the home. The fire was moving up the stairs, and that's when Jackie helped the kids ages 8, 7, and 5 out of an upstairs window where neighbors helped them get down. She didn't panic. She was, you know, calm getting the kids out. Um, she didn't cry. I just don't know why she didn't get out. Jackie lived here in the house with the children's grandfather. He was not home at the time Saturday morning. The family tells me some of the children suffered minor burns. However, all three of those children are out of the hospital this evening. Live in Harrisburg, Mike Straub, WGAL News. Um, so the HPD officer, uh, she was doing her job. Uh, she threw all of, the, all of the kids in our ambulance. Um, so they, they all survived, correct? Yeah, all the, all the kids survived. Uh, 
couple had uh, some some bad burns. Um, <laughs> And I mean, you have four kids that have never met these these two people in the back of an ambulance. So some of them are just crying because of their injuries. Some of them are crying because they didn't want to be around us. Some of them were trying to get out of the ambulance, but like we were the only uh, kind of safe haven at that point. Um, and we were just on the radio, like, "Hey, we need help." Um, our supervisor he got on the radio and he's like what do you guys need and we were like we just need hands we need people he opens the back of the ambulance and said oh <laughs> oh <laughs> um and uh so to to go off of what Jayla was talking about uh the grandmother uh subsequently uh lost her life uh perished, perished at the I, I believe right at right at the window, um, where she was handing her grandchildren down to the officer. Uh, that uh, that was a tough one, um, just because the everything that we were seeing with the kids um, and you have your own kids at that time too. Yeah, I had uh, I had a well have. Um, a three-year-old now, so she would have been right around one at that point. Okay. Um, so they, uh, knowing that the the grandmother kind of gave that, not kind of, she gave that ultimate sacrifice. Um, that's to, still, that's, even talking about it now, that still hits me. Like, yeah, she, she, I bet she knew in the back of her head. Oh, uh, ab- absolutely. She wasn't gonna make it. Yeah, huh. I, I mean, pulling up, seeing. Uh, seeing the fire, uh, it, it was, I mean, evident to to us that uh, it was not sustainable for long, um, and so I I would imagine she probably knew that, uh, and that really hit home uh, that that the the family family aspect of uh, of love uh, that family uh, had a loss, but they also were able to celebrate four lives being saved uh, and uh, also celebrate her life uh, in a, an amazing way. Yeah. So. Opiate, our opiate epidemic here in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Where, do, where, do you, where do you sit on that? How do you feel about that? Are we getting <laughs> a handle on it? Are we handling it correctly? That's a, it's a really touchy subject. It is. Um, I, I hold it uh, a little closer uh, to my heart, uh, I guess you could say, uh, my, my best friend, Robbie, uh, he actually died, uh, from an overdose. What, if anything, can be done to stop the heroin and opioid epidemic in Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania ranks among the top states in the country for drug overdose deaths. Here at home, the number of people becoming addicted to powerful pain medications is climbing at a very alarming rate. And so I tried to handle those calls with a little... With a with a lot more empathy. Um, did did you know he he used? Yeah, it was a it was kind of a it was a long long process, um, and he was actually in rehab uh, for it when he when he uh, had overdosed, um, and so I, I tried to uh, I tried to look at. Again, I, I give everyone an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's really easy to get angry and yeah. short. Yeah, and I, I've seen it firsthand with yeah. a lot of providers, especially when you're visiting frequent flyers three or four times a day. Yeah, it's really easy to be short with them, and you don't intentionally do it. Mm-hmm. But I think that there's a level of anger and irritation that comes from it. Yeah, and I can understand clearly where you're coming from. You've got to you've got to remain empathetic to these individuals. Mm-hmm. I've never had an issue with substance abuse. Yeah. So I, I it's, I couldn't understand them. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? But it, it, it definitely is a, uh, I had just a, a quick personal experience of, uh, of opiate withdrawal. Uh, I was in the hospital. Uh, they were giving me morphine uh, all the time, sometimes uh, unrequested uh, for, approximately like like four days um and then cold turkey 
uh, they were like, all right, time to go home. You're good. And so I get home and I start having withdrawal symptoms. I call my mom. She's a nurse. Uh, and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I was just very anxious uh, as well as other symptoms. And she was like, you're, you're withdrawing. Uh, and I got to be honest, that all was... Took, all it took was four days. Yeah. And that was the most miserable I've ever felt. And I, I get it if there was a way to get rid of that. I, by using it again. Right. I, I, if I was in a different situation, I, I could see that happening. Yeah. On the Health Watch tonight, addressing mental health matters. A sweeping effort to improve mental health services and change public perceptions was announced today by Pennsylvania's governor. Health reporter Stephanie Saul is here with details for us. Steph. On this new initiative that was announced today in Harrisburg, combating stigma is a big part of the plan. Governor Wolf says the campaign is similar to what the state did in response to the opioid crisis. We don't handle uh, mental health uh, the way we should in Pennsylvania or the states. And I think that uh, that plays a lot into addiction. Actually, I've had this conversation this week about how we handle mental illness. Just just in Cumberland County, we're just specific to Cumberland County. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my clients is a uh, retired California Highway Patrol. Okay. And out there, their CAD systems, their, their 911 systems are so detailed. Yeah. When he pulls a license plate, um, if anyone has any any mental his, mental health history that they've mm -hmm. been admitted for, it comes up. That's awesome. If if they if they're known to be combative with police because they might be schizophrenic, it comes up. And it says it allows us to either scale back and say, well, we don't need this many people, mm -hmm. or it allows us to bolster our response because yeah. we're going to need more people. Yeah. And he said, in in return, if you look at the statistics, California has the lowest police involved shootings of the country. Really? And you wouldn't think of that because yeah. it's California. Right. He said, um, but in Cumberland County, there's nothing nothing like that at all. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you're walking up to. Yeah. We've seen incidents like that in Lancaster. Uh, what was it? Philly, they just had a mm -hmm. shooting. Yeah, you're right. We don't handle mental health appropriately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, just, we just don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, that's the way to put it. And, and I think it's, it's hard. Um, I, I think uh, I think with more funding... Uh, we would be able to, uh, we would be able to help some of those scenarios, um, and and better equip uh, your public service uh, professions uh, to to better serve uh, patients. So, do you have any like career changing, career defining, any moments of cause where you're just that just pinpoint? A moment in time for you something that pops out that kind of either changed your career shifted your career or made you a better provider made you look at things differently yeah um so we had a call uh it was it started off just odd we got dispatched uh for a got it got dispatched as a children and youth um, which we, we never got dispatched for those. Uh, it's, it was an odd thing, kind of seemed like a police uh, incident. So we went into it just thinking, what is this? Um, we get on scene. Uh, there's a children and youth uh, worker there. And just the look in his eyes, we knew it wasn't going to be great. Um, and he said, hey, I have... Uh, a bunch of kids inside, uh, not well. Uh, parents aren't here. Um, it appears that they haven't been here for for days, if not weeks. Um, had uh, kids from the age of uh, eight months old to twelve years uh, to ten years old, I believe. Mm. Um, and there were a total of ten of them. So uh, there was some family on scene that uh, they were the ones that went to go check on the kids, hadn't heard from family in a while, went to go check on these kids, found them there by themselves. And the condition that they were in was uh, uh, unbelievable. Um, had every, every kid had just dreads of lice. Um, covered in fecal matter. How long do you think they've been left alone for? It, adding everything together, it sounded about two weeks. Mm. 
That's the stuff that makes you jaded at the world. Yeah. It just um, makes your chest jaded. Yeah. And and it was in an area where we didn't, you wouldn't, ex- you wouldn't think that that would happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it just, I don't know, it, the, the terror on the, on the kid's face. So we had to, we, we went through and we basically triaged them, um, looked at all their injuries, uh, all of their, uh, uncared for wounds, things like that. Uh, some of them were malnourished. Um, and come to find out, uh, the their five and six year olds were taking care of this six month old baby, um, and and doing the best that they could, and and it was it was it was a very different call, mm-hmm. um, but we, uh, my partner and I, we it was it was probably about a six hour incident, um, just from. Um, from triaging them, uh, transporting them to uh, a couple different hospitals, and then uh, we we decided to hang out with them at the hospital. Um, we didn't want the staff at the hospital to have more people to have to decon. Uh, by the time we got to the hospital, we both had lice in our hair, uh, on our beard. Huh. Um, huh. It it wasn't it wasn't great. Uh, we didn't want anyone else to have to go through that, so we ended up uh, we we deconned uh, the kids, hung out with them. We already kind of had that rapport with them, um, so I mean, it I would say in my career it just it gave me uh, a very humbling experience to uh, to give your all into every patient. Um, Those kids are gonna hopefully remember you. Yeah, yeah. Those could be the kids that are like, well, why did you become a doctor? Well, there was this paramedic. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, you know, they had an impact on my life. Yeah, they they ended up. Uh, we were, they were thinking they were gonna have to cut uh, two of the girls' hair just because it it was so matted and and covered in lice. Um, we ended up. We were we were just gonna cut our hair with them. Um, Trunk shears. <laughs> and they uh, they didn't they ended up not doing it uh, while we were there. Uh, come to find out, they ended up cutting their hair. Felt super bad for them, um, but it was a uh, it was a humbling experience. Yeah, being being biracial yourself, mm-hmm. has there any been has there been any moments in your career where being biracial has come into play? Yeah, uh, I, th- I think there, there's been... Uh... Hello, 911, there are black people. Ma'am, stay calm. I'm scared too. The officers are on their way. What people could perceive as negatives and positives. Okay. Um, but I always like to shed light on the positives. And... Uh, we need more of the positive right now. Yeah. Uh, working... Uh, I, I've mainly worked in urban environments. Um, and so being... Being biracial, being a black male, um, and and working in uh, emergency emergency medicine in the urban environments that I did, uh, I was one of the only ones, uh, one of the only black men, uh, to do so. So it was, it was, it was neat going on scene um, and being able to relate uh, to. Being able to relate to folks, being able to relate to the oh. African American community. So when you went into urban environments, mm-hmm. did they feel more comfortable with you? To be honest, or did you feel more comfortable with them? I I I feel comfortable around anyone. Okay. Um, but there was a certain um, I mean, you you work you work in these depraved areas, um, and you see how joyful uh, people can be. And being growing up uh, as a young black person, uh, I there there was always something that resonated with me with with those uh, with the African American community uh, where we worked. Um, that they're they're so joyful. Sorry. That's all right. Sorry. Um, Would you say they almost don't even, they don't even realize, like, 
me as an outsider, mm-hmm. I look at it like, well, they're struggling. But to them, that's not struggle. Yeah, that's just, just life. Just living life. That's just life. Um, I, I think there there is a struggle uh, that they're that they're very aware of. Uh, but uh, what I've found about the black community is they are strong, um, and they they find resilience. Resi- they <laughs> yes. they find they're they're so resilient, and they find joy uh, in the most unlikely places, uh, and that's that's what resonated with me the most. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what I take from, uh, being a black man in emergency medicine, Mm -hmm. going and dealing, uh, with all sorts of folks. Um, it, it, it was nice and relatable, um, to, to find that joy in the struggle that everyone deals with. Um, some people get depressed about it. Some people don't know how to act about it. Uh, but something that I found in the in the African American community is just a a joy in the moment. Mm. 